When I started preparing for this panel, I had a tough time. I come from Zimbabwe, Africa. Stories in mainstream media on Africa often only have to do with war and misrule as if we can be distilled into one single story. Yet, if a conflict has affected one's country, it feels disingenuous to not want to shine a light on that. While several Zimbabweans are having a positive impact on the world, many of my people are suffering. So I ask myself, why do I write? What does it mean to be a writer right now? I see a writer as one who is in constant dispute with the environment. She conflicts with the culture around her and needs to write back to make sense of herself. I was born in the middle, Midlands part of Zimbabwe, raised and educated in the southern part of the country, and have for the past 17 years making a living in the north in Harare. I was an outsider in these places because they were intolerant of identities like mine, female, creative, single, no children, and still finding my path spiritually. So what do you do when you exist outside of the culture? I have to fight through my writing to make space for myself. In the midst of that, I have seen young people going through mental health crisis, young women and young girls being made vulnerable and abused by the economic and political situation because of decades of state-sponsored violence to silence dissent, religion used to co-opt people into a singular narrative, sexuality being weaponized for political expediency, and fear being mortgaged until it became public fodder. Zimbabwe is a country with some of the most educated and hardworking people on the planet. We are often warm and friendly to visitors and neighbors alike. Yet, searching for better lives, Zimbabweans have been forced to leave their homeland to become outsiders in new cultures. In the early 2000s, inspired by the poet and novelist Dambuzo Marechera, young poets pushed the boundaries of artistic expression. The unrestrained totalitarian rule had stolen our future. We joked about how in Zimbabwe there is freedom of expression, but what comes next? Laughter and poetry were our way to distract ourselves from the deadly threats. And it worked for a while. Our audiences and readers were happy to be seen until real life portrayed on pages and stages became a new kind of trauma. Writers had to create alternate realities so that readers could escape their realities. In my travels, I've often been asked, why do you stay in Zimbabwe? And why do you keep going back whenever you get a chance to leave? Well, I keep going back because I believe things will become better. I am hopeful, so I keep writing. One year after a coup in 2017, we held our first presidential elections. After these elections, protesters were shot by the army on the streets in broad daylight. Although there is evidence, no one was held to account. With the current administration rising, promises were made to revise laws, IPA and POSA, which limit freedom of expression and movement. A few months ago, the government made clear that no art or media would be broadcasted without going through the censorship and entertainment control unit. So if you live in a country of constant change, with powerful men using violence to get more power, using sophisticated machinery to silence dissent, what is your purpose as a writer? For the past few days, I've been having illuminating conversations which are sum up like this. You, the writer, have been blessed with gifts, a voice and a chance to exist at a particular time and place. But you must choose what you dedicate those gifts to. Should you, go, should you ignore injustice, oppression, and violence? Or should you speak truth to power? So many choices to be made, each with its dangerous consequences. I come here today believing beyond anything that writing means carrying the voices of my ancestors into the living world, locating myself in a larger narrative. It is about valuing the small stories, keeping the memory alive to another myself and my people. 
It is to be truthful to the contradictions, shedding light on what it means to be human in a place of crisis. And what is my place? It is to exist and create a space of imagining, recording the present and offering kinder futures. And because terrible powerful men are afraid of the writer's voice and will do anything to silence it, the writer must isolate herself from harm, be self-aware, make space for their healing, and create places of dreaming and wonder for themselves before they can do the same for everyone else. I travel a lot, but I consider Poland my home. Unfortunately, this home has become very difficult to live in. In healthy democracies, it is normal to have disagreements and conflicts. However, in my country, the nationalistic and populist government has been destroying democracy for seven years now. The tensions have turned into a nightmare. Every time our ruling party violates the constitution, I tell myself, now we've hit rock bottom. Things can't get worse. Still, things do get worse. For instance, when the Law and Justice Party, what an ironic name, dismantled the independent Supreme Court and Constitutional Tribunal. Then, during the pandemic of spring 2020, just before the presidential elections, a hideous campaign was launched by supporters of a right-wing candidate involving hate speech against the LGBT com community. This candidate, President Duda, Duda, Duda. was re-elected re -elected thanks to the propaganda of the public media run by the regime. I felt ashamed. On top, new troubles arose in October of that year. During a raging pandemic, the abortion ban was enforced. Conscious of the danger to catch COVID, thousands of people protested of this, on the streets regardless. As if this had not been enough already, the following fall, we witnessed the tragedy of refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, and other countries who were imprisoned in a no man's land between Poland and Belarus, pushed back from one border to another. Our government refused any kind of humanitarian help leaving them dying in the forest from hunger, the cold, and untreated diseases. After Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24, all these problems became overshadowed by war and the huge influx of Ukrainian refugees who were very welcomed by our authorities. How do I write in this situation? When your own country is heading straight into disaster, and the war is suddenly so close. When you read news about women being raped by Russian soldiers or about volunteers in the Kharkiv Eco Park who got shot while feeding animals. I am a poet, not a journalist. When the war erupted, I felt paralyzed. Everything I had written so far seemed irrelevant. But what should I do, stop writing at all? or use my writing to respond to this overwhelming catastrophe? How? I had no language for what was going on. According to a popular cliche, a poet is someone sitting on a cloud high above the ground. Well, that's not entirely true. In Poland, we have a long tradition of socially engaged poetry. For example, authors of the New Wave, a poetry movement founded in the late 60s, exposed the absurd of communist propaganda and its linguistic manipulations. And before them, the great classics, Czesław Miłosz, Tadeusz Różewicz, Wisława Szymborska, and Zbigniew Herbert, were all responding in their works to the experience of the Second World War. None of them lived in an ivory tower. Yet, at the turn of the 80s and 90s, along the democratic transition, a new tone found its way into Polish poetry, the need for more personal writing, not necessarily concerned with huge collective struggles, but giving more room to individual voices instead. 
Poets were tired of having to serve some noble cause. They wanted to be able to write as they wished. As Marcin Świetlicki put it, I have a toothache, I'm hungry, I'm lonely. This intimate tone is, I think, important. It can also be a form of rebellion. Poems with ethical missions, <clears throat> responding directly to political conflicts and war crimes, are sometimes, though rarely, remarkable works of art. But often this kind of poetry, full of good intentions, is merely another kind of journalism and quickly gets old. That said, I must admit that when the first shock passed and words started slowly coming back to me, I wrote a poem influenced by the war in Ukraine and then another one. I was surprised. I thought I would remain speechless in the face of these events. I was writing on impulse, not out of obligation. For me, the only obligation for a poet is to be free in what they create. The goal of authoritarian regimes such as Kaczynski's, the leader of the ruling party in Poland, and Putin's terror is to limit us by forcing us to think about our entrapment only, to narrow our horizons. All our energy is spent on frustration and fear. Free poetry that protects the individual, an intimate voice that creates space for imagination and experimentation allows us to breathe. It can be like a door in the wall that we thought was blind. Okay, now it's my turn. How to write comedies when you are not allowed to laugh. I was working on my first novel when the riots broke out in my hometown, Almaty, on January 4th of this year. The riot known as Bloody January erupted after a jump in fuel prices in Kazakhstan. The novel was a comedy-centered story about a guy who had been running away from relationship all his life, ghosting his dates. Uh, the story was lovely, funny, and engaging, or so I thought. I was already excited to put the last dot on the manuscript and experience that feeling of supreme pleasure familiar to every writer when they finish their masterpiece. At the same time, I was also editing a modern children's tale written by a very respected math professor in his fairy tale, a boy named Sky and his little sister named Sun defeat the evil Robert disarm the witch and help many people gain their freedom. So on January 4th, I opened the window to get some fresh air when the sounds of what I assumed to be firework burst. Unfortunately, it wasn't the fireworks fox hanging in the air, but smoke caused by bombs. It wasn't the fireworks fox hanging in the air, but smoke caused by bombs. Like my neighbors, I spent the next few days in a city with no local government, no internet, no bread, no banking, no walking traffic lights, and no ambulances. Instead, there was the sound of gunfire, the smell of gunpowder, hourly news on the radio, and rumors, one worse than the other. Some of the rumors, unfortunately, turned out to be true. Trying to keep my sanity and some samples of order, I turned to my computer. After sitting in front of the screen for a while, I turned it off again. Neither my hilarious Gustin story nor the tale of a boy named Sky and a girl named Sun were making their headway. The problem wasn't the lack of ideas or form or structure. The problem was that these were funny, good stories. And now, after all that happened, they seemed to me utterly irrelevant. They just didn't make any sense in this new reality around them. I live near the square and beautiful quarter of the city. More than 200 people died during the January riots, basically next to my house. Then less than two months later, after the events in my country, one of the most terrible wars on our continent broke on Ukraine. Could I go back to telling my funny stories? If so, to whom? And most importantly, why? At least I had now, now I had plenty time to think. What other internal conflicts and contradictions does a writer face besides the rights? As an editor of an online magazine, I had to turn down some authors if the editorial board found their work too political. 
even if their work was damn good. A recent concert for the best novel in my country recommended not touching on politics, especially the politics of recent years. It's easy to stigmatize a writer nowadays because of the style, language, and subject matter chosen. In meetings with other writers, they would explain how they abandoned some ideas simply because they were afraid of the reactions they might encounter. I try not to touch on religion because it might cause resentment, one said, or I would rather not draw any parallels, you know, or I leave the subject of the nuclear test site for safer times, and so on. Even months after their January riots, nothing changed. People, it seemed to me, didn't care about stories at all anymore. Then, in May of this year, there was a theater laboratory in my city. There were seven dramas and one comedy, my comedy. I was worried, but people need to laugh sometimes too, the director replied, making a surprise face. A little later, I got my first production offer from a state theater. Of all the plays, they chose a comedy. Once again, I was reminded that people sometimes need to laugh. And we published the tale of a boy of Sky and his little sister, Sam, in the middle of the war because people, adults, and children need to laugh sometimes. My experience of the last months taught me that usually we as writers decide for ourselves what kind of writing is appropriate and what is not. And sometimes we make mistakes, as I did, forbidding myself to laugh and joke after the tragedy. Looking back, I realized that I've gotten more offers for my work in the last six months than in all previous ones. In most of the time, people wanted my comedies. I still haven't returned to my first novel, but I know that someday I will. Thank you all for the open and open questions. Um, before I do that, just to say that we will have more copies of the presentations here presently. And uh, for those who are watching at home, if you go to the IWP UIO.edu website and click on archives, you can find all of the presentations from previous years and uh, next week we'll have these presentations up as well. So now, uh, we'll open it up to the questions. <laughs> Thank you, Zaza, and Christina, and Aynur. Uh, Christina, uh, uh, hello. Yeah. yeah. As a poet, I always ask myself this question: Should I be uh, uh, writing about my life and reflected in my poetry, or not? Because uh, if I do that, it always appear like a political poetry. And people say for me, oh, you write political poetry. And I say for them, no, I don't. Yes, you do. Yeah, I'm not. I, this is my life. Yeah. And, yeah, and uh, my Swedish friend and German friend, they do the same. They reflect their life, but it became a normal poem, what yeah. I call not political. So now you mentioned that you write one or two poems after the invasion yeah. of Ukraine. Do you think this is a reflection, as a reflection of your memory and experience, and it's appear like that? Do you consider it uh, political? Everything in the end, uh, class and gender and everything is political. But do you see it as a political poem, or it's reflecting your life like you write before about other stuff? Yeah, I think uh, I remember when we were talking about this, and you said that you don't like don't like consider yourself political writer and. I like it because it's the same with me, and I, uh, yeah, I wrote some poems uh, about the war, and even earlier I wrote some things that might be considered very political, but I always thought about it uh, as writing from my life experience. Uh, the same as you, like you have to be really somehow immersed in something or uh, like shaped by by some experience uh, to write about it, and and often they are just very political. Um, so I would not say like this about myself, that I like started to write political things. But I, I think it just, um, this is what I, it's, it was like a short paper, so it's difficult to say it. Uh, but I think it's very simple, like if you write, you, you just have to be open to all kind of uh, experience. And if you need to write uh, like very, I don't know, um, 
very like political thing or like a protest uh, poem, do it, but I don't like to be told that I have to do something. Like in, in Poland, we really have this special situation when the poet was always uh, in the situation of serving some, some causes and it was never like uh, what I wrote, like if you said something about your like private life or about some small things or describe the bicycle in the street, it was like too little. So, um, yeah, I don't know. But I agree with you. I think it's, uh, um, you just write from your life experience and, yeah. Could I follow this, uh, I was in Poland this spring and it struck me that uh, after all the divisions in the country, mm -hmm. uh, that you sort of eloquently outlined here, uh, that it seemed to me that, that Poles as a, in, in large had embraced the Ukrainian. Yes, yes. And, and does that push all the other divisions aside or how, how do you, how do you do, uh, respond to that? I think it doesn't, uh, it, it like in a way covers these divisions or like overshadows them because this is true like uh, people in my country were very and still are very generous to the Ukrainian refugees. It's not government, like they do nothing at all, but just like ordinary people, they do a lot. And I think it's also caused by the fact that before with this situation, with, this, uh, with the refugees between the borders, people were really helpless because uh, government would not allow even journalists to go there and there was some kind of special zone that uh, nobody could go there, not journalists, not even like uh, humanitarian help, just nobody. And people felt really um, like devastated. So then I think it's a kind of like psychological reaction that uh, if they can help, they, they like do it. Um, but, but it's not a good situation that this huge conflict covers everything else and, it's, and the problems are not solved, other problems. So, yeah. But just one more thing to return to Gaia's uh, question because I think it's important, like, I observe in my own writing that it is just changing and uh, and you can sometimes embrace things that before you would think it's impossible. Uh, yeah. That's part of the new language you are learning. For yes. You, yeah. To express it. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I have a question for for all Zaza and I know. Zaza, when you uh, when you mentioned the coup, mm -hmm. and then you mentioned to uh, the uh, telling truth to power, and this is the most dangerous things in some situation. So some sometimes we are not able to do it like uh, under dictatorship and totalitarian. But then you mentioned your ancestor. I, I really like that. That is a very poetic idea, and I'm really connected to poetry. Uh, ancestor stories. Uh, most of them ended that you saying truth to the power. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so uh, how uh, maybe in the prose is different than poetry, but it's like this: if I say, if I speak about my ancestors, mm -hmm. so I find I, I, then I, it became uh, poems about Palestine. You mm -hmm. understand, yeah. Yeah. which yeah. is not the end. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, I know uh, in uh, in Syria under the most classic uh, dictatorship, it was uh, the most difficult thing, uh, censorship is for the comedy, actually. So you could do what you want in theater. And, uh -huh. uh, yeah. wow. But the comedy is where you could, uh, yeah, you will go, like, it's, you, go, you disappear. Mm -hmm. Because in the comedy is connected always to the caricature and to the, and because this uh, Kalila and Dumna, when uh, Ibn Muqaffa, 1,000 years ago, he wrote these stories, and he make uh, the king is the lion and all the birth, and of course, they kill him immediately because they understand the stories is, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I don't know. I still so, want to leave. Double you. question. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, all right, you want to begin? Okay. Um, yeah, definitely, uh, before the 2017 coup, freedom of expression was still limited 
uh, the government still had instruments in place that censored artists. So you also even had uh, plays being banned. You also had books uh, being um, banned and not being allowed to be sold in Zimbabwe. But then we are also a mass of contradictions that sometimes a play or a book that you'd say, oh, definitely they're going to ban this, they wouldn't do anything. So you're always mm -hmm. in a very uh, unclear uh, place because there wasn't a clear uh, public messaging in terms of what was, uh, what was allowed or what wasn't. But what was very clear was that you were not allowed to criticize uh, the current uh, government under uh, Robert Mugabe, uh, who was then taken um, down by the coup. And they actually say it was a coup, not coup, but there's not, never a coup that is not a coup. They even say it was a bloodless coup, but people were killed, people died. Um, and, and, but when they came, they, they, this current administration, they made it seem as if they were a new kind of people, a new kind of administration, a new uh, political leadership, when they were actually just the same people who had kind of put on new clothes. Um, and, and so even when they were coming through, they said, oh, we have these uh, really terrible laws, which were the laws I was talking about, the IPA and POSA, that were limiting freedom of expression and um, uh, freedom of movement. So under um, IPA, you could literally um, be arrested on a very um, funny law that said you were doing a public nuisance. And public nuisance is, <laughs> you, can't, you can't define what that is. Um, so they said, oh, now we are new, we're going to change, we're going to revise these laws and make them better. This was in 2018. And now, this is how many years later, four years later, about a few months ago, they said, no, everything that is going to be performed, everything that is going to be screened, whether it's a film, a movie, a, a book, a play, a, a music, concert, it has to uh, pass through um, a censorship and entertainment control unit. And the reasons that they would give you um, uh, between, oh, this is uh, not good for um, public um, morality yeah. as a society, or this is not good for public safety. And it, again, their decision is final. And again, the parameters in which you're being told you cannot do that are not clear. But we as artists, we've always tried to then, you know, tell stories within these difficult situations. Sometimes, uh, sometimes artists would be afraid to also even express themselves because it's not just themselves that are under threat, but it's also their families, their children, mm -hmm. everyone else. But then if I ta start talking about stories to do with my ancestors who were there before this government came, so well, <laughs> we'll see. I mean, if I also set my plays in a place that is futuristic, that is fictitious, even if it's similar to the current government or current situation, can they come after me? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I hope I answered you. I responded to them. So it was uh, more like comment, not like a question, but uh, I would also tell that, you know, I can relate because you see, like we are talking about the same mm -hmm. things here and it's kind of like, I never read what this, uh, what girls uh, wrote before, but I was really struck because, you know, we have kind of like the same lines, like we talk about the same things. And talking about uh, comedies, I think the main point I wanted to, to make, yeah, I agree, we need to laugh, we always need to laugh. And you know, like, so, the most oppressive governments, they fear when people laughing. So for them, it's yeah. the biggest, uh, you know, kind of like fear. So I'm talking more about some kind of like internal censorship we put on ourselves when we think, we, oh, this is out of place, you know, this is just like, uh, doesn't fit anymore, whatever. So. I think like my main point, point was that sometimes we think too much, mm -hmm. really. So we need just like, you know, <laughs> we just need to stop. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> but the censorship is strong. Uh, you mean political? Yeah. And the, well, uh, oh, oh, well, it depends. You see, like uh, sometimes uh, what I hear and uh, we don't have these laws, yeah? For example, like mm -hmm. people in Zimbabwe have, uh, yeah? But still, like, it's on, on some kind of like different level, yeah? It's like from, from, for example, I don't know, like some state theater wouldn't never, you, you just know by, yeah, the self, yeah they would never, yeah. yeah, but we have, uh, we have other ways, we have internet, we have independent, uh, you know, journals, we have, you know, a lot of uh, ways to express ourselves. Just gonna say nothing more serious than a joke. Right? <laughs> uh, 
Thank you, uh, uh, Zaza, Christina, and I don't, I don't know if my question is relevant, but uh, I uh, noticed that both Christina and I know mentioned about the feeling when you feel that your works are not irre are irrelevant to the social context. So I'm curious, uh, in your, in your uh, process of writing, uh, do you ever think about how your readers will react to this? Will they love it or they hate it? Or you just write out your design? Uh, I don't, like, when I really write, I don't think uh, about a reader, because if I start to think, I will not write anything. I just, uh, it's just like I, I write what I have to write. But um, I think what we both wrote, because it was even the same word, like irrelevant, uh, it was not only with writing. I had this feeling with all, like, my life, my, uh, you know, my joys, my, my problems were irrelevant. Everything was irrelevant, really. If you see, like, uh, just disaster happening. It's not like when I wrote that the war is so close now. It's not that I'm afraid it will just, I don't know, come to Poland. Not, not that, but you just, uh, always there is somewhere some terrible war. It's not that it erupted now in Ukraine before it was great, no. In Syria, there is a war. It was all the time in Ukraine, but farther. And now I just feel it is so close. I can really, like, almost physically feel it. So I felt just, you know, how can you, like what I know said, how can you love? How can you do anything? Uh, but um, I think it's like a, this um, psychological mechanism, which is. Um, just allows you to survive, and at the same time it is terrible that you cannot uh, all the time, uh, you know, look into this, uh, into the face of tragedy. You cannot just, um, at some point, you just come, go back to your normal life, if you can, of course, but uh, it's impossible to be always like on the edge of, of disaster. I mean, even people in very extreme situations, they find way to somehow just go on. Um, yeah, but but to answer your question, I I never I never really think about readers <laughs> afterwards. Yeah, but during the writing, no. Yeah, it's better not to think yeah. about them. How is them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I know. Yeah. Yeah. Hellism. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. yeah. No, it was directed to Christina and I know. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, oh, should I answer that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a bit of both. Sometimes I just um, write from, if I experience something and it really moves me, I then just start writing whether it's a poem. I remember there's a poem that I wrote in one afternoon, uh, and this was, but it had been like weeks of just really thinking about it, and it wasn't about who was going to read that poem, I just needed to kind of make sense of what was happening around me, mm -hmm. and uh, what was happening, it's, it's called Knocking on My Head, and it deals with the police brutality. I wasn't interested in performing it uh, to um, a, a potential audience, but after I had written, I was like, okay, this looks good, but am I ready to perform this? Mm -hmm. um, yes, and am I ready to get it published? I think the readers would love it, but at the same time, you, so then you start also thinking about readers after the fact, but sometimes uh, I think of readers right at the beginning as I'm developing an idea. It, it all depends really in terms of uh, the kind of, um, whether it's a play or poem I'm writing and what the inspiration is for it where it's coming from. But one question, one more related to this. Does, did it happen, for example, that you wrote something and uh, maybe you were invited by a special group or a theater or so who you would not relate to, like politically or so, and that they say, ah, that's so nice, uh, let's, or, or just a publisher or so. so did this happen, and if yes, how do you handle with that situation? And Zaza, can you, can you repeat the question so that the people at home can hear it? Yeah. Uh, okay, so the question is, uh, did I ever have an instance where I was invited to perform 
whether it's a play or a poem uh, by people I didn't agree with politically. Yes, that happened. <laughs> and, and it was a very awkward moment. I don't remember, I think it was probably 2012, 2013. I, I, when I saw the, the message where they were inviting me uh, to this event, it was, um, I think it's a, it's a women's group for, um, that is under some organization, but I know that they closely um, were linked to the ruling party. And I was busy thinking, are they trying to trip me up? Are they trying to set a trap for me? What is happening here? Uh, so I also even had conversations um, with friends who are within the industry and I said, okay, so what do I do? Because if I say no, then they'll know that I, I don't really like the ruling party. And that's not what I'm trying to come across. Like, I just hate what they do to our people and what they do to our economy, to our country. Um, and I didn't want to start a fight that I wasn't ready for. So friends said, you know what? They know your poetry, so go and perform it. Mm -hmm. And I did. And they liked it, which was a bit discombobulating. Because <laughs> I was like, this is a bit, <laughs> I don't really understand what's going on here. But maybe it's also because we, when, you, when you are on opposite sides of a political divide, by the way, I don't belong to any political party. I'm an artist, I'm a writer. Uh, but we are often always uh, said to be part of an opposition. And so when you exist on different sides of a political divide, sometimes it's very difficult to see the humanity in each other. Mm -hmm. And you start forgetting that it's possible for people to even connect with things, even if they, on the larger scale of things, they have a difference in terms of political opinion with yours. Yeah. But I wouldn't do it again. Uh, it was a very stressful time. <laughs> I'll add a little bit, if I can, yeah, regarding this question. Uh, it's a very interesting question, yeah, because we always kind of like feel a little bit awkward. So when usually, like, I get such a request, uh, I usually warn people <laughs> before, <laughs> like, I don't know, you know I'm a feminist, yeah, you know I'm whatever. So it's kind of like to make things clear from the very beginning. And I often feel like sometimes to refuse is a good option. At the same time, I feel like sometimes maybe it's better to collaborate. You know what I mean? Because we are human in the end, yeah? And no matter of our, of course, I'm not talking about some kind of like extreme, yeah, political uh, disagreements, yeah? But generally, and uh, I think, uh, I, I hate to talk about writer's responsibility. To be honest, it's, <laughs> it's not an issue, but Sometimes I feel like maybe we should just connect, and this is the main thing. Hi, um, Zaza, Christina, and I know wonderful presentations. Um, it's excellent that you, um, all three of you, are able to provide laughs and uh, comedy to your country uh, within the conflict, um, you know, situations as well. My question is that. How are you able to sometimes separate yourself from the conflict that's happening? And do you feel that it's incorrect sometimes, you know, if you're posting, whether it's social media or if you're writing about something and there's a disaster going on somewhere else, do you hold yourself responsible or do your readers sort of say that, okay, you know, there's such a big thing happening and they are talking about a love story or, you know, a personal account. Is there an undertone of conflict in your work or are you completely able to separate yourself and be able to provide that positive, you know, um, sort of note to your readers and people who watch your plays? Anyone can answer it. Okay. I, I can answer because... Um, or you wanted to yeah, say, yeah? yeah? Okay. No, because for me it was, uh, yeah, the, in this spring it was a very important question with the, when the, the war started in, in Ukraine and I was like, uh, I thought like, uh, yeah, I couldn't like, I, I don't use social media almost at all, but still sometimes I post something so I was, I was like, no, I will not like post anything like about me or that I published somewhere or something, no, because it's like, inappropriate and I had this feeling very strongly and also it was the moment it was late um, February and I was like I had my book almost finished uh, it was uh, in the like I sent it already to the publisher 
and there were many like really personal poems there, like completely, you know, just like not touching on this uh, huge struggles at all. Uh, but then I started to, aha, uh -huh, okay. And then afterwards I, I did write something uh, about war. It was really just like coming out of me and I added, I like asked my friends and I asked my editor, do you think it's good to add it to the book? And like after some consideration I added, it's, it's just two small texts. But then I, when I was rereading this book, I noticed that I, you know, I always have this, even the language of conflict, like whatever I, I write about, like even if I write about, you know, love or, or just uh, all kind of human relationships, it's like always the, like very strong opposites. And uh, it, it really struck me that like I have this kind of uh, conflicted language everywhere. Um, not maybe this exaggeration, but like a lot. And I started to think, about it that like I, I never uh, reacted openly to like political conflicts in my country, not, not openly, nev never, but sometimes I, I probably was influenced because I have this kind of personality that, that I see like the opposites all the time or, or some kind of contradic contradictory uh, situations, so yeah. Yeah, I think it's, um, uh, People, when they are experiencing um, difficult situations, they always come to the artist, they always come to the writer to kind of articulate what it is that they're going through. And the expectation is quite always high. But if you're a writer living within that situation, experiencing that, I think the first responsibility is to yourself. So if it means even just taking a moment to breathe, to really process what is happening, before you say, oh, let me give you a poem to make you laugh, or let me give you a poem to make a sense of this, or let me give you a play uh, to, to feel other things other than what is happening. Because we are human beings as well, first, before we are expressors of all these other things that we, we create as artists, as writers. And uh, I, I genuinely think that I think you need to take a moment for yourself first in the situation before you proffer up a solution. I mean, if you are moved immediately to write a poem to make people laugh, if you are moved to write a poem to uh, kind of paint a picture of what is happening, then go for it. But I think the first responsibility is to you, yourself, as a human being. Yeah. I absolutely agree with Zaza. So do what you can do. Don't push yourself, oh, I need to write about this right now because yeah. they are all kind of like write something from me. No, just do what you can. I think during this uh, hard time I wrote about, I edited, uh, in, not edited, I published a play of another playwright who was able to write about this, yeah? I wasn't, but she was able, so we published it. And I did some, I don't know, charity work, something, you know, just for, for my conscience, for myself. And that's it. Do what you want, do what you can. Yeah, I will just maybe yeah, add one thing because I think I agree with Zaza and Ainur, and you have many ways of like helping or taking respons responsibility as a person. You can really like, I don't know, be volunteering and so on. And uh, with writing, yeah, it's really important just to like think and to do, yeah, do what you can do and what you feel you are somehow, uh, you know, uh, what is in your, what you are ready for. Like, because if you push yourself, the, the, the poems or the novels that like try to deal immediately with everything that is going on are really very often just very flat and uh, yeah. So. Other questions? Yeah. So, Christina. Uh, I really like your poetry and I feel that we are connected. We were even touring the world for the same festival we never met. Like That's you true. either go before you or after you. But I, I, I have a question, two questions. One uh, not related to literature in the direct way and then one to the literature. About the history of Poland, like after, after the destruction of Poland by Adolf Hitler. Yeah. The, 
Polish people were refugees all over the world. There were 60,000 refugees in Iran. Yeah, in oh, one yeah. small village in Syria, uh, the inhabitant was 700 Syrian people. There were 3,500 Polish refugees. That's so it's sure. like five, six times more than the people. But people in Poland, they have really fish memory. They refuse to accept any Syrian refugees. They mm -hmm. make demonstration about this 1,000 refugees that they accept in 10 years. Every day they were demonstration. That's I don't know why they do that, but anyway. And they are very welcoming to the uh, uh, Ukraine. And that's very great because this is how it should be. Uh, the question is, uh, do you relate the tough history? And you know, uh, after that, there's the occupation of the Russian, the Soviet mm -hmm. Union occupation for this long period. Do you relate something after this long history and this memory to the metaphors? Because I notice when I read the translation, and I read a lot of translation for Polish, and we have, you know, translation mm -hmm. from Morocco, from Syria, for most of the Polish people. I notice that. During the tough time of uh, the occupation and during the Soviet Union, there were a lot of metaphor. After 1989, the metaphor began to disappear. Mm -hmm. And I always relate the metaphor to patriarchy. We use a lot of metaphor when we are under dictatorship. And when I left to the Europe, uh, the metaphor began to disappear from oh, my country. So I always mm -hmm. connect metaphor to the, to the patriarchy. And because you were born in 1979, so you got both. So I want to know. <laughs> And this question, and do, uh, yeah, and uh, you know, Poland is considered to be one of the greatest uh, literature in the world uh, mm -hmm. in the past and uh, this day. Do you, th you find yourself, uh, if you consider yourself a feminist, uh, uh, anti-metaphor? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's it. Okay, so, it was uh, like many things in what you said, so, okay. First, with the refugees. Uh, mm -hmm. I am really very angry because I always think about it like we were so, Polish people were for so many years refugees uh, during the communism and there were so many other countries helping us and now like we don't want to help anybody. With Ukrainian people it's different and this is the only thing that somehow saves this nation but it's not enough I think. It's like uh, Ukrainians are also like close, cultu culturally close, and everyone who is like different, you know, it's just this fear, homophobia, and everything else, which and homo xen xenophobia. xenophobia, but homophobia too. It's like <laughs> everything, <laughs> everything. <laughs> so this is uh, something terrible for me. Then with the metaphors, I think there are many things here because it's also what Zaza was saying, like during the all communist time, we had really strong censorship. It was official. You, to publish, you had to pass through this. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, like this metaphor, very, very strongly metaphorized language. It was the way to omit it, you know, because censor, censors were sometimes very stupid and you could really uh, publish quite a lot of things if you had like good, uh, you know, good idea how to mask it. Um, but, and yes, I am. I consider myself feminist, and I don't write in such a metaphoric way. So probably this is also connected. I never yes. thought about it like this, but yes. it is connected. Sure the, uh, the metaphor mm -hmm. connected to, uh, to uh, uh, censorship and dictatorship. But the question is: Is the metaphor connected to patriarchy? I would, I, you know, I would yeah. have to think about it really, yeah. because I never really thought about it. Uh, but maybe there is something. Uh, I, for me. Uh, but it's a bit different conversation. Very, like, there was, uh, I don't know if you know Witold Gombrowicz, uh, mm -hmm. like a very f wonderful Polish writer who, uh, who lived in Ar Argentine and Argentina and he was, and he's translated into many languages and he was always like a clown or jester, can you say like mm -hmm. this? Like just uh, destroying all this, you know, myths and like martyrology. And he also was very much against poetry <laughs> because he said that like uh, in poetry there is too much sugar. And he meant metaphors, that like metaphors are so dense, you know, and it's like eating desert all the time. Uh, and then in prose you have, it's more like a full meal. And this, and I always, I don't agree with him, but, but at the same time I thought about it that I like when I write to introduce some other, 
like yeah, like narratives to the poem or, or, or some tools that you use even in reportage just to make it more diverse, not only this metaphoric, lyrical, very, very dense language, not, not just the sugar. Mm -hmm. But I never connected it to like patriarchy, but maybe there is something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. I would have to say that some, when Zbigniew of Herbert writes a poem called The Pebble, yes. he's using the metaphor because he knows the, the censors won't understand it. Yeah, this it. was the thing, like with yeah. this really great poet, Herbert, who was always very, very like anti-communist, yeah. he used this cryptic language just to, you know, have it published. Yeah. And first he wrote for the drawer. Yeah, yeah, for, and, many, for yeah. many years, yeah. yeah. And then he discovered this other way of going yeah. forward. Yes, you know. yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I think we might have time for one more question, if we have any. Yeah. Hmm? Well, maybe two, if it's quick. OK, I, uh, maybe uh, this would like to have a, we can discuss this question later or something, because I found the topic of today is like cultures in conflict conflicts, but uh, somehow when we talk about conflicts, we shift our attention automatically to political conflicts, whereas, you know, uh, probably because I think the uh, Natasha or someone said this uh, title because as, unite, as in a free speech country like United States, there, there might be no censorship or something. So they are facing different kind of uh, cultures of conflict, which might include your interpersonal conflict, your mental or inter-relationship -re conflicts, uh, things like that. It is beyond censorship or, you know, of course that is the huge part of our struggle. So I would like to, uh, I would, would love to know if any um, culture of uh, conflicts you experienced, for example, like your lifestyle choosing, you know, your Maybe not that lifestyle you choose is not the mainstream of your society, something like that, beyond the uh, political <laughs> things. Uh, um, yeah, I, I kind of touched on that in my presentation when I was talking about how uh, in all the places that I, I, I grew up in and I was born in and where I'm now working, I'm an outsider because they're not tolerant of identities like mine. Uh, because if you're a woman, they expect you to be, by a certain age, maybe by 25, you're married with children, and you're raising a family, and I'm 36. Single, never married, uh, with no children. Um, and, 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 and with my experiences, just even navigating private and public spaces, I always also come, I encounter difficulties, which I have to kind of navigate, and I'm, I've, I've, I've become quite adept at that. And, and that also then comes into my work because I also then try to then profile uh, female characters that are beyond the mainstream idea of what a woman or a Zimbabwean woman is. And, and that's what I try and do. And sometimes my readers connect, sometimes they don't. Um, but I, I also enjoy that uh, recently, even my older aunts have been telling me, don't believe the hype. Getting married is a scam. <laughs> so, but like when I'm talking about older aunts, these are like probably in their 60s, 70s, who are saying that now. But when I was growing up, and even when I was a bit younger, there was always pressure to say, why aren't you married yet? Uh, and why aren't you having baby? At some point, even say, oh, you're fine. Don't get married. Just have babies. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. I will tell you, Zaza, when you reach one, certain point of your age, people stop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they will. Yeah, no, I don't think they will. It's Until maybe I'm, maybe I'm sick, when I'm sick till seven, they're like, okay, fine, <laughs> great <laughs> answer. <laughs> yeah, in Poland, they, they, it's exactly the same for me. Like, uh, in Poland, they don't stop. Like, I think, yeah, they ask me questions all the time. Like, I don't have children, this is one crime. But in Poland, everything, like, if you have one child, it's, it's too little. If you have uh, three children, it's too much. Like two, two, two. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I was always also an outsider, like because, for example, I was always like a freelance. It, it was also something strange that I don't have like this one job. And also to be a poet, it's really, uh, I was ashamed many years to say it aloud. 
because uh, people would ask you, I, I, I would always say I'm a translator or I am like editor or whatever. If you said you are a poet, it was like, but, okay, but what, what you, do you really do? Like, <laughs> what do you do? Yeah, you, you are a poet, you write poems, but what you do like in your life? So, like men, what, what Zaza said, it's per, this, perfectly um, the same with me. It's the same, just nothing to add. Absolutely, yeah. I can relate because I've been asked so many times what my normal job is. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, yeah, so we, I think all of us, yeah, kind of like need it every day. I think we'll close with that. Uh, uh, Christina, your countrywoman, uh, Vyslava Szymborska, said in her Nobel address that Joseph Brodsky was the only poet she knew who would actually declare himself to be a poet yes. in public. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say uh, uh, what a wonderful set of presentations and discussion. Thank you so very much. Thank you.